All right, let's talk about the good stuff, um, all the, the good traits, how the good traits evolve. Uh, and good traits, I mean, uh, things like uh, generosity, kindness, and compassion, uh, empathy. So let's have a little thought experiment. So think of all those good traits, all the traits that make a, a morally upstanding, you know, you're, you're a perfect person, essentially. So think of traits like such as, uh, they'll probably have kindness, right? They'll probably be generous, willing to help others, uh, sensitive, um, nice, uh, honest, you know, um, just basically altruistic or, or willing to just help others at a, at a personal cost. Um, so we could just take all those traits and sort of just lump them in the category of just being pro-social. That's just a pro-social. Now let's think of uh, the opposite, right? All the bad traits, the nasty stuff. Um, so that individual is going to be uh, like dishonest, um, deceptive, um, not going to display any empathy at all, uh, and just basically just selfish. Okay, just just selfish. So just just put all those in the category, all those that whole suite of behaviors in the category of selfishness. And we'll say, okay, that's a selfish individual. So so now let's continue with our experiment and say, let's have this little island, so this little deserted island out here. And we'll just take some individuals that possess these, these, these bad traits and we'll just put them on that island and we'll take some individuals that possess all these good traits and we'll just put them on that island uh, together with them. And we'll say, okay, now who wins? Well, obviously the selfish individuals. Uh, so you're probably thinking, oh, are we supposed to be explaining the good traits? Uh, how did we get here? The reason for that is, because uh, I wanted to point out this sort of this, this common misconception about evolution by natural selection and that is that, that it could only explain the, the bad traits, that it can't explain sort of all the good things. And, and you can see how that'd be a problem for any sort of scientific theories, particularly when it's trying to explain the, the natural world. For one, if you can't explain all these good traits, such as you know, the, the, these cooperative pro-social traits that really do define us as a species, um, then your theory is not really that complete if it can't explain the, 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 the full repertoire of sort of behaviors that you see out there that it seeks out to explain. And second of all, if you can't explain these, these traits, then how useful is this theory for us? You know, what, what's the point of even, of even learning this thing? So it's not really a ring endorsement um, when you can so readily sort of explain these negative uh, traits, these selfish traits with it. And Darwin himself, uh, uh, this was not lost on him. Um, he would be out there marveling at the, the immense cooperation displayed in, in these social insects where you have these workers uh, tuned to the specific task um, that the county is entirely dependent on, yet that worker is not reproducing. Um, so you go, how, how could that exist? So imagine a social insect colony. Imagine, say, uh, leafcutter ants. These things are prolific. Um, so they'll have these, these massive colonies. They'll have millions of individuals, anywhere from five to 10 million individuals. And they vary dramatically in, in their body morphology. So you'll have some of these workers will be large and then they'll, um, they'll defend you know, the, the colony or help clear a sort of a path for the foragers to get out and back. Um, and then you'll have these foraging uh, uh, casts and they'll all come in different sizes. And they'll just they'll, they'll head out in a nice little trail, a manicured trail, and, and, and find the tree of their choice or the plant of their choice. And then they'll cut out these little segments of the leaf and then carry them back all the way to the colony. And there's actually even some of these, these small workers that'll ride on the backs uh, of these leaves or ride on the leaves and sort of be the lookout for any sort of parasitic fly that might be uh, harassing the other the workers that are carrying the leaf. So these, these foragers are going to bring these leaves down into the nest uh, and, and hand them off essentially to the gardeners. And the gardeners are going to take these leaves and, and farm them uh, to produce this fungus, or essentially to grow this fungus on these leaves. And then they'll harvest the fruiting bodies. And these, and these gardeners have amazing uh, specializations themselves. Uh, they have these, these grooves inside of their exoskeleton that accommodate um, this bacteria that lives in there. And this bacteria will actually produce these antimicrobial uh, agents, like antibiotics. Uh, and then these gardeners 
will just dab at those and sort of move it around to keep their fungus tended so that way these fun the fungus that they're actually relying on uh, isn't infected and their in their county sort of and their garden isn't sort of taken over. So these are basically the original farmers when you really think about it. So when you look at all these beautiful casts that are out there, you say, wow, you know, like these special workers, all these soldiers, and these gardeners, and even ones that'll tend to the offspring, say, but none of them are reproducing. Only the queen over there is reproducing. So if all the ones that are possessing all these amazing traits, these pro social traits, aren't having babies, and the ones that aren't possessing these traits are having all the babies, and how does how does this work? How does this exactly fit in? Um, so, uh, welcome to the, uh, the paradox of social evolution. Natural selection is obviously really good at explaining um, a selfish uh, trait. But it can also explain the pro-social traits just as easily. All you have to do is change your focus just a little bit. So if we return back to that original example, we're talking about islands, right? So instead of looking at what's happening within one particular island or within one, one particular group, what's happening between uh, islands, what's happening between uh, these groups. And these islands, they're going to vary in their composition of pro-social uh, and selfish individuals. So some islands are going to have a lot of pro-social individuals and some islands are going to have entirely you know, uh, selfish individuals. And you're going to have obviously a bunch of islands um, um, with intermediate frequencies of, of both. But if you just simply look or consider what's going to happen to the overall island or the overall group, uh, you can clearly see, um, you can clearly imagine that populations of these, these islands that have more good individuals or more pro-social individuals, uh, they're going to persist longer and they're going to have a greater success than islands that are overrun with selfish individuals. So within groups, uh, within the island, uh, you can clearly see the advantages of, of selfishness and deception and, and so on and so forth. But if you're looking at what's happening at the island level, then islands that possess more um, or have greater frequencies of these pro-social individuals will actually have greater success and greater longevity. Um, so you have these sort of competing forces uh, of for natural selection. They're both natural selection. However, you have natural selection operating within groups within the islands, and you also have natural selection operating uh, between groups. And obviously you have completely different uh, suites of traits, so albeit still natural selection, um, it's natural selection uh, at different levels, and that's what we call multi-level selection. There's also an example from the poultry industry of how selection favors completely different suites at, at these multiple levels uh, compared from within groups uh, to between groups. So I'll let Dave Rison Wilson explain this, uh, this, this compelling example uh, from the poultry industry. So natural selection is obviously really good at explaining um, a selfish uh, trait. But it can also explain the pro-social traits just as easily. All you have to do is change your focus just a little bit. So if we return back to that original example, we're talking about islands, right? So instead of looking at what's happening within one particular island, or within one, one particular group, what's happening between uh, islands, what's happening between uh, these groups. So now let's expand our example. So let, instead of considering one island, let's think of an archipelago, right? And these islands, they're going to vary in their composition of pro-social uh, and selfish individuals. So some islands are going to have a lot of pro-social individuals, and some islands are going to have entirely, you know, uh, selfish individuals. And you're going to have, obviously, a bunch of islands um, um, with intermediate frequencies of, of both. But if you just simply look or consider what's going to happen to the overall island or the overall group, uh, you can clearly see, um, you can clearly imagine that populations of these, these islands that have more good individuals or more pro-social individuals, uh, they're going to persist longer and they're going to have a greater success than islands that are overrun with selfish individuals. So within groups, uh, within the island, uh, you can clearly see the advantages of, of selfishness and deception and, and so on and so forth. But if you're looking at what's happening at the island level, then islands that possess more um, or have greater frequencies of these pro-social individuals will actually have greater success and greater longevity. 
Um, so you have these sort of competing forces uh, for natural selection. They're both natural selection. However, you have natural selection operating within groups um, within the islands, and you also have natural selection operating uh, between groups. And obviously you have completely different uh, suites of traits. So albeit still natural selection, um, it's natural selection uh, at different levels, and that's what we call multi-level selection. There's also an example from the poultry industry of how selection favors completely different suites at, at these multiple levels uh, compared from within groups uh, to between groups. So I'll let Davis on Wilson explain this, uh, this, this compelling example uh, from the poultry industry. Whenever the discussion becomes too abstract, one should talk about chickens. Gary Larson knows that, and so do I. So chickens live in groups, always have. In modern poultry industry, the chickens are crowded into uh, cages of nine or 12 uh, hens. And so imagine that we're a poultry breeder, and we want to increase egg productivity. In both cases, we have lots of hens, lots of cages of, of hens. And we're going to select in two ways. In the first experiment, we're going to um, find the most productive hen within each cage, and we're going to use those hens to uh, breed the next generation. In the second case, we're going to monitor the productivity of entire cages, and we're going to produce the most, we're going to pick the most productive cages, and we'll use all the hens in those cages in order to breed the next generation of hens. Now, it might seem that we're sort of selecting for the same thing in both cases, and that the first experiment would be more successful, because after all, it's, it's individuals who produce eggs, and by focusing on the most productive individual in each cage, wouldn't that be more efficient than the clumsy way of choosing groups, in which case some of the individuals within the groups might not be so productive. But as it turns out, and if you think about multi-level selection, and you can see that we're actually selecting for different traits in these two experiments. And in the first experiment, we're selecting for psychopathy. This is the actual result of the first experiment of within group selection. And what you see here in the first place is only a few hens because they've murdered the other ones. And they themselves have had their feathers plucked out because aggression is so high. And, and this, this is, a picture says more than a thousand words, but this actually says nothing more than what I said in words that natural selection within groups is insensitive to the welfare of the group, and that if a hen can achieve her productivity by suppressing the productivity of other hens, then she's the one that gets selected, and then she has aggressive offspring, and things get worse. It's paradoxically, it seems like negative heritability that you select the most productive hens, but the traits that you're selecting when they become common cause everyone to be less productive. So natural selection within groups is insensitive to the welfare of the groups. If we continue this experiment, it will only get worse. And here's the result of between group selection. These are happy chickens. They want to be your neighbor. I like to think of them as Mr. Rogers chickens. And because we're selecting for cooperative interactions, and we're selecting those interactions at the group level, that's how we get the selection for productivity in hens. And this is, in fact, the method that's used to select for um, egg productivity in, in hens. So you can thank the eggs in your icebox for, for, uh, for group selection. So now when you consider competition at the group level, then behaviors such as cooperative hunting, um, cooperative territoriality or cooperative defense, um, or even communal care of, of offspring these traits and these behaviors start making sense. Uh, when individually, it seems sort of counterintuitive or paradoxical, but when you take a step back and look at the group level, and you can really sort of see uh, the advantages of these traits. But natural selection is not really always about one level or the other. They're both they're, uh, operating, um, not necessarily always in conflict, um, but they're both operating. So you have to really account for what's happening at different levels to really see what's going to evolve in the overall population. So let's take a hypothetical example of uh, group defensive behavior. So for example, in this, in this behavior, if you see a group mate uh, gets attacked and you run and, and, and quickly come to their defense, you know, maybe you might help them <laughs> successfully survive 
I uh, maybe not, but but maybe not. But you're you're taking on a personal cost at running over to, to help, and you're and you're potentially benefiting that individual. So the alternative is to simply not do that. Uh, to simply, um, you see an individual get attacked, you just go, ah, well, you know, it sucks for them, but it's not me. Um, so you can either run to the defense, or you can either not. Um, so let's just say. Uh, we have a population that is broken up into just three three groups, uh, and we have our both of our strategies here. We have the ones that are going to run off and help out. Um, these are going to be our light colored individuals, uh, and then we have our selfish individuals that are going, mm, yeah, I don't think I'm going to help out. Uh, and those are going to be our sort of our red, darker dot uh, individuals. So we have one population, and it's broken up into three groups. Uh, these groups vary in their uh, proportion of, of altruist versus selfish individuals. So we have one group that has 75% um, of them are these, these cooperative defenders and 25% of them are the selfish individuals that won't. Um, and we have a group that has 50-50 has uh, and then we have a group that has 75% uh, of these selfish individuals and only one uh, cooperative defender um, in that entire group. So if we just look and say, okay, uh, let's see what happens after one generation living in these, in, in these groups or what happens after sort of selection um, occurs. So we can see what happens in this first group that has that 75% uh, selfish individuals and only one sort of cooperative defender. We can see that one cooperative defender is no longer there, um, probably died trying to help someone. Um, and the three that are left, essentially, uh, only had one offspring apiece. So you could see that in that group, um, that selfish strategy went to fixation. Uh, I mean, it went, it, there's 100% there of them now in that group. Now let's look at the intermediate group, uh, where there's 50-50. Um, you see that the, the cooperators, these, these cooperative vendors, well, they were quite successful. They had a couple offspring apiece, not so bad. Um, but obviously they're taking on a greater risk by, by running to help all the time. Uh, so their survivor rate is going to stay, certainly going to be lower than those of the, the cheaters that just take those benefits. Uh, so they're going to have about three offspring on average apiece. Um, they're all proportionally do, doing better than the first group that I mentioned uh, because they have more individuals that are actually looking out and, and, and defending against you know uh, potential risks that are out there. Now let's look at this third group. Third group, that was 75% you know, of them were these cooperative defenders that are sort of looking out for everyone's success. You can see that they're doing fantastic. Uh, each one of them are having four offspring apiece. Um, very peaceful environment, obviously. They're all helping each other. So the survival rate for all individuals should be, should be pretty high. And you can see that it's actually higher um, for the selfish individuals. Um, because they have all these cooperators running around to, to defend them anytime they run into problems, but they don't have to take on those risks, so they're doing quite well. They are having five offspring apiece, uh, or the one is having five offspring apiece. So you can see that they're actually increasing in frequency in, in that group. So if you look, you can see that these, within each and every single group, these selfish individuals have increased in frequency. But if you look at what's happening, obviously, between the groups, then the group that has the most uh, cooperative defenders, on average, the individuals there are producing more offspring uh, than the population that was overrun by these selfish individuals, or the group that was overrun by selfish individuals. So if we just simply do the math and we look and say, okay, who wins in the overall population? Then despite the, the defenders, losing and, and decreasing in frequency within every single group, they're favored in the overall population. And, and it, it, it kind of seems a little bit, you know, counterintuitive at first. And you say, how could you lose within each and every group, yet win in the overall population? And if you think of this almost like a, like a pizza pie, right? Well, if, if, you're, if everyone fighting over getting the largest slice ends up shrinking the overall size of the pie, then you might get the largest slice, but, but, but it's of a small little pie, as opposed to having a relatively small uh, slice compared to others in for that same pie, but a very, very large pie. 
so ultimately what's happening is when you're comparing how these individuals are doing within to between groups, you're not just saying how did you do compared to everyone else uh, sharing that same pizza, it's how big is your slice compared to um, the slices of individuals in other groups as well. We see this conflict between the levels of selection over and over in the animal kingdom. Uh, and research on lions present a great example uh, of this conflict. So lions, they've always been known to be very cooperative. I mean, they engage in, in group hunting, uh, they engage in communal cub rearing, uh, and, and group territory defense. And it all makes sense uh, because larger prides completely dominate smaller pride. Uh, and solitary individuals have dramatically reduced uh, survival rates and are frequently killed. Um, so it's no surprise uh, that, you, that you really see a lot of this cohesiveness and, and cooperation occur in these field experiments. So these are actually cool how they do these experiments. Um, they do them right out there in, in the wild. And a lot of times they'll take the form of, of, of audio recording playback. So they'll, they'll have these loudspeakers that they'll either hide or they'll put near some, um, some fake lions and they'll play these, these, these sounds roars, some kind of territory, so things that, things that uh, signal a threat to the territory. And they just simply look to see who kind of comes towards them. So routinely, uh, these, these experiments show that these animals usually come up in groups, obviously, because the more groups that, uh, the more individuals that show up, the better force you're exerting as a group and the more successful that pack is going to be. Um, however, this outcome was analyzed a little bit more detail um, by Robert Henson and Craig Packer. And what they did is they looked at two years uh, of lion observations. And they, what they noticed is that, yeah, individuals were coming uh, to the defense, but they were routinely just demonstrating uh, individual differences in their personality. So some individuals were always these heroes, these brave individuals that were always the first ones kind of out there. And some individuals are always sort of lagging behind. Uh, and then you had sort of these intermediates, or I guess you can really break down the laggers uh, into two different types. These, these laggers, you just, there were some that, you know, if, they, if things really got sort of hairy and they were really needed, then they'd actually kind of start charging in there and, and, and do their job. Uh, the other ones were just the worst, um, because they not only would they lag behind, if things started getting really, you know, uh, really getting heavy, they just, and they, they just settled back even further. Um, so they're looking and saying, okay, there's, there's got to be some, some advantage to um, you know, this heroic behavior, being, being these leaders running out there, um, or uh, there should be some sort of disadvantage, maybe in the form of punishment uh, for these laggers. And what they found, actually, is that there is no benefit, or there are no benefits. So they weren't any more dominant, uh, they didn't get any more matings, so they really weren't successful, uh, any more successful for expressing that behavior. And the laggers, uh, surprisingly, they didn't uh, face any reprisals for that behavior. They weren't attacked uh, as a result of this um, or punished at all. So it really led them to kind of wonder how, what's maintaining um, this 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 behavior in the population. If we can't see any sort of advantage to this district locally, then what, then what gives? Um, obviously, you could think of, again, success uh, in line that's dramatically uh, dependent on the success of the group. Um, so individuals have this sort of shared fate. And Robert and Craig really sort of captured uh, this conflict and this dynamic uh, in, this, uh, in the following statement. Female lions share a common resource, the territory, but only a proportion of females pay the full cost of territorial defense. If too few females accept the responsibilities of leadership, the territory will be lost. If enough females cooperate to defend the range, their territory is maintained, but their collective effort is vulnerable to the abuse by their companions. Leaders do not gain additional benefits from leading, but they do provide an opportunity for laggers to gain a free ride. So this statement about lions uh, is surprisingly similar uh, to a statement by Charles Darwin when describing humans uh, in a similar context. And this is from his work uh, in The Descent of Man. 
It must not be forgotten that although a high standard of morality gives but a slight or no advantage to each individual man and his children over other men of the same tribe, yet an increase in the number of well-endowed men and the advancement in the standard of morality will certainly give an immense advantage to one tribe over another. There can be no doubt that a tribe including many members whom, from possessing in a high degree the spirit of patriotism, fidelity, obedience, courage, and sympathy, were always ready to aid one another and to sacrifice themselves for the common good, would be victorious over most other tribes, and this would be natural selection. So both these passages are fantastic and they cover two basic um, notions. One is that selection does occur at, at multiple levels, and, and oftentimes uh, these forces are not in agreement with each other. So if you're looking for why a, a trait exists, it might not be immediately uh, obvious if you're looking at selection only at one level. So you have to look at um, what's, it, what's the costs and benefits associated with that trait at multiple levels in order to truly see how selection is operating on the trait overall uh, in the population. Now, multi-level selection applies to more than just selection uh, within groups uh, and between groups. It really exists at all levels of, of biological organization, and you're gonna find conflict at all levels of, of biological organization. So, uh, one interesting example is the, uh, the facultatively cooperative um, uh, cellular slime mold, uh, Dictyostellum discoidum. So these individuals, they're basically little amoeba uh, and they cruise around by themselves uh, until the environment just not good enough for them. Uh, and they're a little amoeba, so if things aren't going well where you are, uh, you can't usually marathon your way out of there. It's, it's a little bit too much of a distance. Uh, so what happens is when they all start kind of becoming distressed, uh, individuals release a compound, a signaling compound, that kind of just lets others know where they are. Um, so they'll all sort of aggregate together and then form this, um, almost just like this slug, this multi slug, and it kind of just moves around a little bit, uh, and then it eventually becomes stationary and forms sort of this lollipop structure where some of the individuals uh, will form the stalk uh, of the lollipop, basically the stick, and then other individuals uh, will form the fruiting body, uh, and that's where individuals will ultimately um, uh, leave spores, and then that it, those individuals will carry on and will, will be propagated to the next uh, to the next area. Um, so the idea here is you can't run out of there fast enough if you're if you're an amoeba; it would take too long. But if you collectively form this sort of lollipop structure, and it can form tall uh, off the surface, relatively tall off the surface. Uh, then, then wind or, can, can, or some kind of disturbance could blow that or can, can send that further away and give those prop, goes as individuals a chance to start another uh, a life anew somewhere else. Um, so ultimately, you, they're working as a team to accomplish this. Uh, but things aren't always uh, um, as nice as, as they initially seem. Um, so what happens is, obviously, if you're uh, one of these uh, amoeba forming this structure, you don't want to be in the stalk, you want to be in the fruiting body, you want to be one of those little spores to, to be able to make it your way out to the next generation. You don't want to be stuck behind. Um, so, but if all individuals try to force their way up into the fruiting body, then the stalk isn't very long and you don't really get much height off of the ground so you don't get the benefits of the cooperation. So you really have this conflict immediately playing out where at one level uh, you have individuals wanting essentially to uh, forcing their way of selection within that slime mold, within that aggregation, you have selection favoring, uh, forcing your way into that, uh, uh, or biasing your way into th the spore structure, but selection at the scale uh, of these aggregates shows the individuals or, or aggregates that have a greater proportion of individuals that are willing to form this stock structure, um, sacrifice themselves essentially for the benefit of the group. Those. Uh, those aggregates are going to be much more uh, uh, successful on average. So you really can see these two dynamics sort of um, uh, playing back and forth. What about the competition um, amongst the cells in our body? Um, that's what cancer is. Uh, you have all the cells in your body sort of following these rules 
and you have these cells in your body that just say, hey, wait a second, um, they're going to take more resources and, and reproduce um, when it's not their turn, essentially. Uh, and that's that, so you can look at cancer in your body. There are the ones that are winning within your body. It's, it's called, uh, referred to as somatic selection. And that's basically saying if you look at your body, uh, essentially, as a, as, as a group of cells working together, then obviously the cells that are able to replicate the fastest and grow the fastest are going to be favored within that group. Although the more the cells that you know behave selfishly like that, the, the detrimental it is to the collective. So you can really think of cancer essentially as as as, as just that. Essentially, as these selfish entities um, that are winning within your body, albeit um, uh, harming your body. So you can see that. The, the, the levels of selection that are favoring cancer are quite obvious. You're going to have selection within your body, you're going to favor um, de the development of cancer, but selection at the, at the organismal level, um, at this multi-organismal level, um, selection between individuals is obviously going to favor mechanisms uh, that actually reduce the likelihood of getting cancer. And, though, and, those, and that level of selection is what's responsible for a lot of these anti-cancer genes uh, and so on and so forth. And believe it or not, there's also competition between the genes within your cells. Um, so every time uh, you have offspring, every time you're producing sex cells, there's only a 50% chance that any one of your genes is going to make it into that sex cell. Uh, remember, you have um, two sets of all your genes. You have your set from your mom, your set from your dad. And when you produce your sex cells, you only send down uh, one set and it's randomized, you know, which, which gene into moving. So it's a 50% chance, you know, all things considered, simplified, that you're going to transmit any particular gene that you, uh, that you possess. Uh, will be transmitted at a, at a higher rate than you would suspect. Uh, and it's what we refer to as meiotic drive. Um, so even at the genetic level, uh, not even your genes, which you obviously they're working extremely cooperatively uh, to have the cell be functional, to have the multicellular organism uh, be functional, but yet even at that level of coordination, you still uh, have the hallmarks of, of cheating and selfishness occurring. So selection is operating at all these levels all the time and often in conflict. So knowing this, what can we do to make things better? How can we use this to our advantage? So one quick thought experiment is imagine uh, if you were in a course and the professor simply said, only one person is going to get an A and everyone else is going to fail. How, how would you act towards your classmates? Would you help them study? Would you share notes, uh, share any tips? <laughs> Probably not. Um, now what if that professor said, you know what, I'm teaching multiple classes and the best class that I have for the semester, that whole class are going to get A's and all the other classes are going to get F's. Now how would you change uh, your behavior? Now how would you act towards your peers? Would you help each other study? Of course. So you see that um, just by changing the scale of competition, you can dramatically change uh, individual's behavior. Um, so again, knowing that, how can we um, use the levels of selection to our advantage to, to improve relations in, in humans um, and to fight against things like cancer, um, bacterial infections, um, and so on and so forth.